I want to thank you all for joining us this evening for the next installment of our Creative Catalyst Speaker Series. My name is Patrick Fisher. I'm the Executive Director of Erie Arts and Culture. The Creative Catalyst Speaker Series is funded in part by Erie Insurance, as well as the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development through their Neighborhood Assistance Program. We are joined this evening by Giella for the topic of creating spaces that connect community. Giella is a bleeding heart, rainbow fueled, passionate nightingale that has taken the form of Giella. Uh, they are a singer, rapper, DJ, and community organizer. They use their passion for music as a vehicle to create intentional dance space for marginalized community in the American South. They are a community organizer and activist in Jacksonville, Florida. They believe in self-expression and hope to provide community events for QTPOCS and Black folks, queer, trans, people of color. And thank you for joining us this evening, Giella. Thank you for that amazing introduction. I so appreciate it, Patrick. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Is the video there? Like, it's on my yes. screen. <laughs> the y'all's video is there? Okay, so I should move it. <laughs> I don't know how to move it over. Or I can maybe move it. So, okay. All right, there we go. Okay, so hello y'all. Thank you so much again for having me, Patrick. I'm so excited um, to be in this space with you all. Um, I kind of want to preface with the fact that uh, my facilitation style um, is really rooted in storytelling and hip hop and spoken word. And um, I hope we can lean into that and foster that and decolonize how we look at workshopping and being in space together. Um, so if that feels good with you all. So I do wanna take a moment of mindfulness um, just so we can really think about like what we wanna take away from this space and how we will contribute to this space. Um, if that feels good for you all, um, I just wanna take a moment where we can all just go off mute and I just wanna hear your breaths and just like kinda of take a moment to just pause in this. I know a lot of people are coming into this space, maybe coming off of work, um, I know for me, uh, being Black and Latinx, living in the South, you know, we constantly are having so many evolving emotions and feelings, and so I really want to honor that and just, like, recognize that while we're in this space. Um, so if everyone feels good, let's um, take each other off mute and just take a deep breath in and then breathe out. All right. Thank you so much for doing that with me. I know I definitely needed that coming off of work. <laughs> um, so like Patrick was saying, um, I am a singer, I'm a rapper, I'm a DJ. I do a lot of stuff, y'all. And so um, I just wanted to show you all just some of the work that I do in my community. Um, I really love using music like Patrick was saying. I really love um, storytelling and being able to talk about my community and the things that I've experienced along with experiences of young people. Um, and I take that into every single thing that I do because it's made me who I am. And this community is made up of just so many different like ethnicities, so many different cultures, um, so many different perspectives, so many classes, and it just really fuels the work that I do. And um, some of the work that is here, like I said, is um, facilitating at this amazing organization in Jacksonville, the um, Jacksonville Arts and Music School, um, rapping and just kind of like teaching young people um, some of the things that they do. So I'm gonna go into um, a short little rap that I wrote just about my experience being in Jacksonville. So like I said, my facilitation is rooted in hip hop and storytelling and I'm really excited to rap for y'all real quick. If that feels good. <laughs> so black to me was always the epitome, but in the eyes my light shone as an enemy. Now mama said that love grows when you let it be, and pain flows from tears of dark years. When living fair was for real, having colored skin was a war. Telling us being light and living behind a porch and equality fueled a fire that kept us under a thumb. But I speak from another is love and peace I come. So Jacksonville has got a lot going on. Um, I want to give you all some context of where my state is and what is happening here and why I do the work that I do. 
Um, and I also have some of um, eerie statistics as well. It was very interesting to kind of look into what's happening in Pennsylvania as it is relation to Jacksonville. Um, so this information was all taken from 2018. Um, the top information is just talking about, you know, our population, the median household between um, white households and black households. Um, some of the major demographics in Jacksonville are black, white, and Hispanic. Um, we haven't gotten the 2020 census yet, but I'm, Jacksonville's pretty much, um, the Hispanic community is definitely on the rise. Um, but you know, there's a lot of like power struggles that have happened in Jacksonville. Um, Jacksonville historically was kind of one of the most like racist places um, for black people to live in. Um, if you look at it historically, it's named after Andrew, Andrew Jackson, one of the um, Confederacy founders. And it just, sometimes it can just be a really tough place for not only black people, but also um, queer people as well. This, um, report that happened in 2018 at the bottom um, was surveyed by 671 LGBT people in um, Jacksonville talking about their relationship with law enforcement and you know how they just have felt untreated just by being black or being Latinx um, combined with being um, queer. And in 2018, um, Jacksonville also was the number one um, city for black trans women being murdered. And so in 2018, it was just a really, really tough year for um, cutie pop folks. And it just really had me thinking about what I can do um, to kind of support my community with all of these oppressions working against us with, you know, all of this, like, pretty much a scared state for trans people in general, and how I can support them in that um, so we can create spaces. And so this photo um, is from a really amazing um, graphic artist. Um, and something that she wrote on a t-shirt was, you know, marginalized bodies dancing is power. And us being in the same space and sharing space with each other is power. And it really um, disrupts, you know, communities. And it just like gives us back that power that we really need to have. Um, and DJing around the city, I, you know, experienced a lot of pushback, you know, a lot of microaggressions from um, the community talking about, you know, types of music that I can only play and how music is only set um, to one certain night, like urban night is when hip hop music is played or this night is when, you know, that needs to happen. Um, we don't want that crowd to come on this night, you know, so it's very, very segregated and it was just very frustrating and you know, just felt very um, stifling as an artist, you know, I want to be able to explore, I wanted to be able to create a space that really felt good, not only for me, but also felt good for my community, because point blank, we were dying, you know, we were losing a lot of sisters in our community. And it was just a very, very hard place in 2018 um, to live in and to be in the queer community um, because these people were dying at very horrific ways. And, you know, we were just scared. So what um, birthed that was... Bless you. Um... Sorry. <laughs> so what birthed that um, was my dance night um, called Duval Folks. And the thing that I realized that was happening in the community was, you know, we weren't calling out these systems and using that to kind of help power our night or help power the, uh, the type of music that we're doing. And so when I was thinking about like advertisement and when I was thinking about what I imagined my night to look like, you know, I was really focused on making sure that the space, you know, had no sexism, no racism, no homophobia, you know, and really naming out all of those oppressions that really hurt my community. Um, and then thinking about the advertisement, like what type of people did I want to see at the party, you know? And so I really um, had to bring that into fruition. And, you know, that's what forced us with the, um, the marketing and like having all these different like ethnic groups and different body types and um, sexual orientations. And it just birthed this beautiful, um, this beautiful marketing piece. And these, the uh, collaboration that I also did was all with 
um, local artists. Um, the video that you see on the, I'm going to try and take this sound out, or if y'all want to hear the sound, um, I'm going to play this video for you all. This video was shot by um, a really young emerging artist, um, Tenny Rudolph, and you know, I met him and saw his work online and I connected with him immediately. And I was like, wow, your work is so powerful. It's so beautiful. And I have this idea, you know, can we, you know, link up together and try to, you know, create something. And we birthed this beautiful video. And he's like, yeah, I know, you know, this artist, that artist, let's all come together. And half of these people are like some of the people that I know and the other half are folks that like Tenny brought to the table. Also other amazing creatives, singers, um, models, sculptors, all the things. And so I'm gonna play this video for you all. And this was the first advertisement that I had um, for Duval folks. Lest you own that stuff and sniff in the blues. The ground. This message is approved by Giella. And so, <laughs> thank you. And uh, yeah, it was, it had, it resonated so hard with the young people in my community because we had never seen this before. We've seen queer, we've seen gay spaces, but we've never seen queer spaces. And queer spaces are just liberate, you know, and completely erase the patriarchy and white supremacy. And we were not seeing that in the clubs that we were in, you know. Um, a lot of the clubs, you know, charged on the POC nights versus the non-POC nights. The POC nights, you know, were given plastic cups versus like glass cups. And we just really wanted to just own that space and just kind of like reclaim it, honestly. And so another um, accessibility point with Jacksonville is uh, Jacksonville is the largest city in the United States land wise. And if you do not have a car, you can attest anyone in Jacksonville, it is so hard to move around. And so we really also wanted to make this space as accessible as possible. So we created a, um, a um, how you say, a uh, carpooling tree together. So certain folks from different communities, if you lived in that same community, you would ride together. Um, very guerrilla grassroots organizing um, on that front. And then we also created um, a sliding scale method. And a lot of people, you know, this is a really like tokenized term, but this was really rooted in um, queer liberation and, um, you know, work that we do. And so we wanted to also identify like, what does that really mean? You know, what is sliding scale and how does that work? And so really explaining to them, you know, um, Basically, if you don't have the money, it's okay. You can still come in here, you know? If you um, are someone that is stably housed or that can afford to take vacations and pay some new items, then maybe you might, might need to pay like $20 or more. Um, and this really resonated with a lot of people in the community who were a lot more privileged because they wanted to see this space happen and they wanted to see this space be accessible um, for marginalized communities. And it really, um, it really was amazing to see the community really hold on to this and honor this system every single time. Um, and it resulted in uh, this. So um, the first night of Duval folks really just, it warms my heart just thinking about it. it also makes me sad because we're in COVID times. <laughs> but you know, over 350 young people came into this space on the first night um, and just the amount of outpour and love that the community felt just being in that space and everyone abided by you know everything that was going on you know when someone was doing something inappropriate you know it was a really like call-in moment and kind of like check-in times and it just really resulted in such a beautiful night um and i think you it can really be seen in these photos. Um, people were just like having so much fun and just so much love in this space. And I think it really resulted from just like calling out these systems 
and also empowering the people in that space um, to kind of <clears throat> excuse me, empowering people in that space to really own it and also reclaim it. So then um, as some of the nights started to move on, um, I started collaborating and started doing like a lot of really fun stuff with other artists in my community. Um, and it resulted in this really cool installation um, by a three person group um, called Slightly Off. Um, and they kind of played on the idea of um, bodies and what bodies feel like and what, you know, what it feels like to, um, to be in spaces that just don't feel right and what our bodies, you know, do. And so um, they created this like all these like little pieces of um, there's like an eyeball right here that you could go inside of it. And it was actually like a 3D, um, you know, when you use the, um, like when you go into like the 3D glasses and then you can see like other images. And so that's basically what the eyeball did and it completely turned around and there was like um, little pictures in the back you can see and basically it was just had like empowering messages like you're beautiful or like you look great and you know other things like that black lives matter um and then we also had like an ear and um there was this really cool nose um and the little pricklies like it was it didn't like hurt but you could put your hand inside of it and the rice crispy treats that were green came out of it it was really fun. Um, it was a really fun collaboration. And I think they made these out of paper mache. Um, and so you had uh, the ear, you had a nose, and then I don't know if you can see in this picture back here, um, but there's also a nipple and some tongues um, and then the eyeball. So yeah, it was, it was really, it was really amazing. And in this room that it's in, it also was um, just another accessibility point. Um, it was kind of away from the party and it also was an alcohol free space. Um, so it just kind of like gives room for people to just like hang out if they wanted to talk to each other, they could do that as well. Um, and then also it's a sober free space. So, and there was games in there as well and they could take pictures in the installation. And so just to kind of like talk about just some takeaways um, and, you know, something that I really tried to lean into was just like also checking in with like grassroots organizations. Um, I tried to invite them to every single event that I did and just have their literature there as well because they are the ones who are invested into the community. They're the ones who actually put their feet on the ground and figure out what the community really does need. Um, and then also finding marginalized communities that need support um, and understanding that youth also belong in art spaces and they need support. Um, the one thing about um, Tenny was, you know, Tenny was a really young, you know, emerging artist and he just was like, you know, no one ever gave me a chance. Like, I didn't know. And so once he kind of like came into the fold with me, that really pushed him to kind of find his um, his momentum and you know now he's reaching back into his community and finding people to uplift himself um, and most of the time that's all they need and I definitely want to say thank you to Patrick because Patrick was someone that reached into this community and found me and really you know sat down with me and he was to come to my office I'll work let's work on your website I wasn't even thinking about doing a website you know and it really pushed me to want to start teaching my community some of the things that I do and then also create spaces um, for them as well and teach other people about it like we are right here it's all full circle <laughs> And so just some um, amazing, amazing resources that I love to use. Um, Emergent Strategies by Adrian Brown. Um, some people are reading this book and it truly, truly is great when you start thinking about how to decentralize yourself and maybe the organization that you're working in. Um, Black Lives Matter, uh, um, found, not foundation, but just Black Lives Matter. They have an amazing toolkit on how to support um, as like a white ally as well. And um, yeah, that's all I have. <laughs> so should we open it up to questions, Giella? Yeah, definitely. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask Giella? I'll, I'll start then with, with uh, two questions. Oh, I can. oh, I'm sorry. I'll let them go then. 
I'm, I'm sorry, Patch. Well, anyway, I'm going to ask the question because I'm <laughs> here. Uh, thank you very much, Giella. I really appreciate it. Uh, I have a question about your marketing materials. There are yeah. two things that struck me. Um, one was being very explicit as to what was not going to be there. Yeah. So, and I thought that was that was very interesting, and I hadn't seen marketing like that before. Um, but something that was a, a good takeaway. And the other one was the sliding scale graphic. Um, I think was brilliant because it, well, it had questions that you could ask yourself. Yeah. Um, can you describe like did you do did you come up with those marketing materials yourself? Was it with the team? Um, and how did you how did you develop them? And then who like demographic age range, I guess, how did you identify who that marketing was for? Like I, I certainly understand um, kind of the identity demographics, but in terms of age, like um, could, that wasn't clear to me kind of like, was it young teens? Was it, was it, you had to be 21 and all up or what, what kind of age range uh, were you? Yeah. With? So the flyer, just to go back to reference folks. Um, so the fly. Listen. So the flyer was created by, um, I forgot to say her name, um, Summer Woods was the one that created that. And so I kind of pulled from um, a lot of different inspirations. Um, the main one being Afropunk, which was an amazing festival that I went to um, that is based all over the world in um, Atlanta, New York, Johannesburg, Africa, Paris, and Berlin. And this is um, something that they really brought to the surface um, as far as like festivals go. And so that's what I kind of pulled from um, to kind of name like what was not going to be into the space. Um, and as far as marketing, um, the space was actually all ages. Um, the first um, event space that we were in was 1904. Then we moved into an actual DIY space um, called Cork, which is um, basically like a big like warehouse that housed like artists in that space. And I forgot to mention this. Thank you for asking this question. Um, so the owner of that space, um, her name um, is Crystal and she, you know, is an artist herself. And she really believed in, you know, what Duval folks was and the messaging behind it and everything. And so when we moved into that DIY space, um, it kind of took away a lot of restrictions and a lot of boundaries. And so we kept it, um, so it is an all ages event. And so when I was thinking about the marketing, I wasn't really thinking about age um, necessarily. I, as, as the movement started, I did want to start including like intergenerational folks in the images that we were doing because it did resonate with so many different people um, because the space that we were in, it was like a venue space. So it was all ages. Um, so yeah, all ages came to the party. So, <laughs> and when I, when I had it in mind, um, like I said, I just wanted to have just like a variety of people, like a variety of different bodies. And I feel like when people saw that, they knew like what time it was when it came to the party. And um, as it's progressed, so many different people have come and, you know, all different ages. I think I answered all your questions. I wasn't sure if I did. You did, and more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but Summer, um, you know, came up a lot with the color scheming. Um, and then my friend, um, sorry, the photo also was taken by Tony, uh, was, he has a, um, a photo group here called Create Jacks. So he really highlights like this community and also a lot of marginalized communities as well. I will ask a question. Um, Obviously, living in the American South, there's a lot of systemic racism, systemic oppression, and I think it's it's much more noticeable at the surface level as opposed to those things that might be more um, subversive and at a kind of uh, subconscious level. Um, but I've, you know, since since being back in Erie. Um, I know of at least one visual art venue that two years in a row has tried to do, um, you know, visual art exhibits specifically for the LGBTQI community, 
um, and then this year for uh, queer youth in Erie. And I know that they have struggled to get folks to um, submit material and content to that show. And I think that even though we're in the North, there's still a lot of um, oppression um, and, and other uh, discrimination that exists here, again, kind of below the surface level. So I think that there's there's a high degree of vulnerability that, that comes with putting yourself out there and being your authentic self um, through your artwork. And I think that, that you have done a tremendous job of being your authentic self in everything that you do. But how did you build up the courage to, to do that? And then what was that process for you identifying your authentic voice as an artist? And do you have any suggestions for um, how arts organizations and the community as a whole can maybe work to create um, not just safer spaces, but also systems that support these kind of risk taking? Yeah, so, um, so what I hear from you is like, how did I find the courage? I think how I found it was from my community. Um, I started organizing with Girls Rock Jacksonville and though in Jackson, in Girls Rock is a, um, is a week long summer camp that empowers like girls, trans, non um, gender non-conforming youth. Um, and it's an international program all over the world. And it was so empowering to see like femmes and like queer people like owning these spaces and you know being unapologetic and I had never seen that before growing up in Jacksonville I'd never seen you know these girls are like half their head shaved and playing drums and like facilitating and just like really taking up all of the space and I went to a conference and I saw you know them from all over the world you know there's you know camps in Tokyo there's camps in Africa Europe London all over the United States and so seeing though seeing that and being emerged in that really pushed me and continues to push me to this day um, because it no it tells me that there's no bounds you know there's no there's no borders like I transcend all of that and I am the expert on that because I I do it daily and being in that space to have people tell me you know this is what this is what you can do or this is how you do it you know it's more than I ever learned from a university from um from the work experience, you know, being able to have that skill share and then also have that bond with those people really pushes me to be who I am and show up as I am because that's when I excel and, you know, perform my best. Um, and then as far as like how to, how organizations can reach, you know, those populations, I think it's like getting, you know, when you have that maybe one or two or, you know, any of those artists that submitted, you know, finding that one and getting them to intern so that they can tell you like, hey, your application process didn't really make sense. Or, hey, like this, you know, application, it was really, really hard for me, you know. Um, a lot of young people sometimes do get intimidated and they don't understand stuff. And so if you get someone from that community that can tell you, hey, this is what you need to, you know, be doing, then you'll know what exactly is happening seat at the table yeah definitely and you know once they are at that table like how can we build infrastructure so that now we can start shifting power to the that community can you so erie is also um a, a we're not obviously anywhere near as large geographically as jacksonville but we have some serious issues with public transportation and equity with transportation as a whole could you elaborate more on that process of designing the, the carpool tree? That to me is like such a uh, brilliant idea. Yeah, um, and that's the same for Jacksonville too, I would say. Our public transit is very, very hard to navigate, one. Um, also, if you are below the poverty level, it's very expensive. Um, they Every year they go up in prices um, for um, you know, transportation. So it can be very, very hard if you don't have like a CBO that's helping you navigate that. Um, but how that worked basically was I created a spreadsheet of all the different um, sides of town. So 
in Jacksonville, like I said, our city is huge. So we do have a north, south, east, and west, but there's about maybe like five or seven communities within that north, south, east, and west. And so, you know, I tried to name like the really, you know, big neighborhoods, like for instance, I know this is not a reference point for y'all, but, you know, south side, you know, I put Arlington, Avenues, you know, um, beaches, you know, et cetera. And so then people would go in and nominate themselves as like the main writer, like the designated writer. And then another space was for folks that needed a ride. And so then they would kind of like coordinate it themselves. Um, so they would have their contact information and then the person who needed that ride knew exactly where they needed to go or who to contact with that. And it, it really worked out. Um, this year, my next plan of action, um, Lyft actually does have a, um, a group rate for when you are trying to do like parties or things and you create a code and then it gives um, that person a discount when they use the code that you created with their um, service. So it's also something to think about. <laughs> Are there any other questions in the group? I don't want to be the one hogging all of Yella's time. I saw I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I missed it, but how how do you fund all of this? Where do the monies come from? Um, so all the funding came from the community. Um, the, as soon as the party um, was like brought into um, from the sliding scale donation, it really funded the rest of the party. Um, and there also wasn't a lot of um, budgeting that had to go into it once, um, ooh, ooh, sorry. Um, so a lot of um, budgeting didn't have to go into it until we moved into more like the DIY space. So then we had um, kind of, didn't have like a bar or anything since it was moving from the venue into the enclosed space. Um, so, you know, I had to have someone come in with like the alcohol, um, but since I had that relationship with the venue, um, I wasn't charged for the venue, um, just because like Crystal really like believed in the dance night and really supported like what I was doing. And so, um, once I did started to secure funding, that's when I started bringing artists into it and then, um, bringing DJs, um, from, south florida um but covid kind of stopped some of this stuff <laughs> so yeah the community really stepped when i tell you the community stepped up they stepped up and they really funded this night thank you yeah i saw another hand too <laughs> yeah i don't want to hog all the questions to you either uh could you I had a question about the one slide, the um, reaching into your community. Yeah. I feel like I want you to do another workshop where you expand on each of those bullet points. Like I would <laughs> love to hear. Um, but the one in particular, finding marginalized communities that need support. Um, so I work in a public library. <clears throat> oh, that's amazing. Usually, yeah, and, and so usually, um, we identify communities that need support when they come in to see us. Uh, we do have outreach uh, staff mm -hmm. and their job is to go out in the community. One of our challenges um, that we've all been asking ourselves is how can we identify communities that aren't coming in that need support? So I, do you have any advice for kind of identifying those communities or an organization that's maybe, let's just imagine just starting out to yeah. search for them. Yeah, I, um, I definitely, that resonates with me. I also work at an LGBT nonprofit. And so we're also experiencing that too, like trying to find out where are our youth at? What is happening, you know? Um, but, you know, for our situation, it's, it's like ja Jasmine, the organization I work at, this is a safe space for them. So at home is, you know, not the safe space. So online is, you know, that doesn't resonate with them at all. Um, but I would say, you know, looking into your, like grassroots organizations like finding identifying those 
and then seeing what, you know, reaching into their network to see, hey, what is going on in your community? Like what is needed? Um, I did notice that you all have a really high like native um, community. Um, I think it was almost like 5%. And I was like, whoa, I've never seen that before. Um, and so like trying to identify like where do those, um, where do those communities lie at? You know, what are they, what are they doing? You know, and where are they at? Um, and so that they can help guide you so you can give them the resources that they have, um, especially, I mean, I don't know what your library is at, but I mean, libraries were always like a huge place for me um, and also like did a lot for me. So yeah, just finding those organizations and, you know, maybe having their flyers available there when they, you know, do like marches or like meetups or things like that. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. I hope that helps. <laughs> I see a hand raised, yes. Hi, yes. Um, I'm really excited to be on this call. My name is Lana. Um, I, one, want to applaud you for creating a space for people that are queer of color. Um, here in Erie, we have a LGBT community, but it's still very divided. Yeah. When I say that, I say that very, very, uh, no, it's divided. It's very still, the LGBT community still struggles with, in its own community, racism. Um, I'm a part of that community. I am married to my wife. I'm bi. I'm a bi Black woman. And so for me, we are still trying to figure out how to create a safe space for people, um, especially people of color in the LGBT community here. And yeah. we find that there are still struggles within our community because of, you know, obviously the religious aspect, um, you know, Christianity is deeply involved within our black community. And so there's still those struggles. Um, we have, I've met teenagers, I've worked with teenagers that still struggle with, you know, coming out to their family. They've come out to us, but they haven't come out to their family. And you know what I'm talking yeah. about. So my thing is, how do you empower, can, do you have words for me to empower me in a way where that would be, where we create a space for here for people like that. And I, I just, I'm really, I'm just intrigued because this is something that we wanted to do here. This is something that we really want to bring. Um, and we have a lot of kids that are struggling, a lot of youth that are struggling. And I just, I'm just interested. This is very interesting because we don't have that here, you know? Um, and so I just would love to bring that. And I really want to connect with you more on how we can bring that here for us. Um, and if there's anything that advice that you could have for just starting that, because again, it's me and my wife and a couple of my friends, but you know, that's, it's very limited. Yeah. Well, first of all, I just definitely want to say I hear you and that definitely resonates with me so hard um, because that's what happened for me. You know, I was really emerged in the queer community here, DJing at clubs and you know, I just started fantasizing about this night. And, and, you know, I saw this type of space, you know, in New York City, I saw it in Austin, I saw it in California. And I was just like, no, I want that here. Like, we also have like an LGBT community that is actually pretty big. But also, you know, there are struggles within queer communities with like how you said with racism with sexism, with classism, you know, all, all of the isms still are in that community, you know? And so that's why when I created and when I was like really curious about this night, I had to name that at first. Like, this is what's not about to happen in here, you know? Because when I was at those clubs, I was told like, you cannot do this. And I was like overly sexualized being a black Latinx person. Um, so I was like, I, this does not feel good. Nothing about this feels good. And so you're saying, you know, all that you had was, you know, your, um, your partner and you've got like all these people, I have myself. And so you already have, you're already like 10 steps ahead, you know? And so I would say just lean into that curiosity and really start visioning what is what does that look like in Pennsylvania? You know, it might not look like what um, Duval folks looks like in Erie. You know, in um, Erie it might be a support group. In Erie it might be a book club. You know, um, but I think starting just with that group of people, even if it's y'all in the same space together, that's still you know radical. That's still resilient in itself. That you all can be together in that space while you're in Erie and thinking about like, hey, 
what does a, you know, a BIPOC space look like in Erie? You know, what does this community want? What does this community need? You know, and that's was, that was something that, you know, that kept resonating for me. It's like, what does it need? Like, what do I want? What, a, what do I want it to be, you know? And how can I make it as accessible as possible for marginalized communities to be in that space, you know? And if you stay true to that, then it's going to keep blossoming and people are going to get curious and people are going to want to support that because you have a clear vision of like what you want and what that community needs and people can't help but want to support it. Um, and especially now more than ever, um, you know, people are trying to support black communities and I would definitely lean into that. Um, seize this moment while people are paying attention to it and also um, look up grants. Um, there's so much more grants now because people understand that applying for a um, for a nonprofit grant, sometimes nonprofits are not accessible to create. So there are a lot of black um, grassroots organizations that are giving to grassroots organizations so that you don't have to have a 501c3c um, you know you can apply for a grant without that and though they're they are available right now so i would say keep staying curious um just vision board it what do you want what do you want it to look like what do you want it to feel like um what do you want to see what do you see in it um and i would um just start there with your partner and with your friends for sure okay okay do it. Thank I you. wanna see I wanna see an eerie folks. <laughs> well, yeah, well my wife my wife actually just became a licensed therapist. Just became licensed. So actually she's working with therapy for um, LGBT community. That's what her that's her passion. Yeah. So but I'm thinking about creative space, spaces that, you know, involve you know, involve people of color, but especially with like the still so much height. I mean, there's so many people that still struggle. So I, I'm like, how do I bring that out? I also feel though, do you think a survey would be important? Because surveying and actually asking people, what do they feel they need? Where do you want a space? What does that space look like for you? Have you done that with, um, with Duval folk? No. So I, I would say I have not done a survey. A lot of people just like would reach out to me um, and so I would say if you can get them like in a Zoom call, if you can get them in a space together, I think that's just so much more um, intimate than just a survey, you know? Um, so yeah, like go talk to your people so that they can put a face to what you're doing, you know? Um, because when I started to create this, I was so immersed in so many different, um, so many different things in my community, like I said, from the hip hop, from the organizing to like doing the, um, the community work so that when it came time to create this, it was like, oh yeah, people were like, oh yeah, let's go to that, you know? I know Giola, I know what they're about, you know? And so getting into your community so that it feels really authentic, not only for them, but also for you, you know? Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing. Okay, I'm going to ask another question. So there was a there was a point in time where it felt like Jacksonville somewhat started to reach this this tipping point or critical mass as it relates to like 18 to 25 year olds that were operating um, within the the creative sector um, and they weren't asking for permission. They were finding independent spaces to host work. They were doing things with very little overhead so that budgets and grants weren't necessarily a requirement. Um, you know, you were, you were definitely emerging during this time period and, and I think we're a very visible figurehead within this, this group of creatives. How did you all kind of communicate and mobilize amongst yourselves, um, but also how important was it for you all to support one another in the work that you did um, so that you had that kind of built-in audience right out of the, the gate. Yeah, I think it kind of was just like an like a unspoken like understanding. Um, just I don't and how it relates to me. I don't know if this might resonate with you, but it's like POCs do this thing where we walk down the street and we're just like, "What's up?" <laughs> and so it was like when you saw your friend like having an art show, 
it didn't, it wasn't even a question. It was like, I'm going to, I'm going to repost this. I'm going to automatically do that. And it kind of was just already embedded in our community. And so then when, um, when things started to get a lot more popular, then of course, young people, they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to go to that. Or I'm going to go to this. I'm going to go do that, you know? And it, it just was like this unspoken support with each other. Um, and I think that really helped, you know, gain a lot of that following. Um, same with a lot of the work that I was doing is that people just automatically would just repost it. And so I think that kind of like guerrilla, um, guerrilla style um, uh, advertising really helped. Do we have any other questions from the group? Well, if not, Giela, would you like to, oh, Jude, I saw you unmute yourself. Do you got a question? I just <laughs> wanted to ask you, Patrick, if you saw that community existing in Erie now, or is that something we have to incubate? It's something we have to incubate. I think that the, um, we have a lot of really great programs that I think nurture creative talent and creative voice up to a certain age, right? You have things like the inner city neighborhood art house, um, et cetera. But it seems like a lot of those organizations kind of cut off at that 15, 14, 15 age range. And because of that, the 15, 16, 17, 18 isn't being nurtured and yeah. because not being nurtured, it's it's hard to identify where it's taking place and existing. I will say a, a organization and group that gives me hope would be what Joey Evans is doing at the YMC 18 Center. Um, I visited with them on a few occasions and um, I think Joey's doing really tremendous things as it relates to video production, audio engineering, uh, they're now adding a, a theater group. Um, they have Caesar Westbrook coming in to teach visual art. Um, so I think that there's there's an opportunity to nurture talent within some of these groups. But I think one of Erie's largest challenges is that even though we have an abundance of space, we lack we lack independent venues to to organize and do things. And I think that you know, when Giela talks about Cork as as an option. Um, you know, that we kind of have PACA as an equivalent, but I don't know if everybody necessarily sees themselves reflected in PACA the way that folks see themselves reflected in Cork because the artists that compose Cork are very diverse. Um, and it's also, I think, a, a pretty, um, you know, a pretty, there's, there's support coming from within as well. So I think that we need, I, I think that the talent exists here. I think that the curiosity exists here. I think that the desire exists here, but I think all of us within organizations and institutions and agencies have to do a better job of creating spaces for it, you know, supporting that risk-taking, um, providing, you know, some financial support around it. You know, I noticed that Giela's one of her uh, you know, bullet points in that sign was pay folks for their talent. And I think that in Erie, you know, our sector is undervalued to begin with, but then when you translate that down to artists and creatives, that's even more undervalued. You know, we want people to do things in exchange for exposure, but exposure doesn't pay a car payment. It doesn't put food on the table. It doesn't pay rent, et cetera. So, I think those are all areas that we need to make bigger commitments as a community in order to see folks um, believe that they have a shot here and that there there is actually an opportunity to um, you know explore those creative skill sets and be rewarded for it. Yeah. Jayla, do you want to share your um, you know your website and social media as well in the chat function so folks can connect with you outside of this platform? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, sometimes it can be intimidating in this space. So if you all want to send me an email um, or, sorry, I'm like, what is my name again? <laughs> oh, that's not how you spell my name. <laughs> my computer like does some weird autocorrect thing. Um, you know, please like send me an email, please follow me. Um, if, if something, you know, um, comes later, I'm definitely totally accessible um, for anything. So y'all can make it happen. Just stay curious, you know, stay creating those spaces, even if it's like five people, 10, 25, like those are still people that you impacted and you don't know what they could do beyond that. So.
Y'all are so lucky to have Patrick. I miss you. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you too. Yes. Well, I want to thank you so much for sharing your, your knowledge and experience with us, Giela. I hope that uh, we have future opportunities to carry on these conversations in a post-COVID world. Perhaps we can bring you up here to DJ. Oh my gosh, that would be so much fun. Yes. <laughs> so again, thank you so much. And I want to thank you all for, for bearing with us through our technical difficulties this evening. As a reminder, this session will be posted as a recorded video in our blog. Um, you know, our, our group is small but powerful this evening. Yes. I recognize a lot of you as being influencers and having spheres of influence and affluence within your communities. So please, um, you know, point others to this resource um, so that we can continue on this conversation and more importantly, continue on this work here in our own community. Uh, but again, thank you so much for your uh, time and presence this evening. Thank you.